join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody, welcome. We're going to get right into our. I need a, I need a motion to approve the agenda. Uh, second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, and then we got action items out of closed session. Got some closed session minutes. Um, I'm guessing a few. January 31st and February 5th. Anybody got anything in there they wish to change? If not, I need a motion to approve as presented. So moved. I have a second. Second. Betsy, please. Yes. Uh, Dury Raj. Yes. Maddox. Yes. Simon. Yes. Worley. Yes. Urevich. Yes. And Cobb. Yes. Uh, moving on, communications 4 1. We got a, a presentation. That you? Did I get to do that? All right. Strategic plan. Okay, good. We'll try. Here it is. Here it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, last last month, what we did is we went through and had all of our our goals, uh, strategic plan approved. So uh, we went through the mission, vision, and so forth. And so this time, what I want to do is we have a present put together so that we can go through each of the steps. Uh, this document's going to be available uh, to the public. Uh, but we wanted to kind of give a full overview of all the participant and all the documents that are included in the direction that we're going. I think what you're going to see with this is we really have a focus. Many of those things are already in progress. It's also important to note that um, this is going to be a living document, something that, you know, unfortunately, I think, unfortunately, when you see strategic plans, you often see them set in stone. And they, every five years, they revisit and pull down and dust off the finder and, and uh, don't do much. So some of these are going to be interactive. We, you know, it might be that we accomplish a goal we intend to get accomplished two or three years down the road. Uh, that'll afford us an opportunity to then perhaps address uh, other needs in the district. I can't take credit for that right there. I would love to. And we're actually going to work on getting that painted on that wall. Um, so that when you walk in, I'm actually going to get canister lights. So that when we come into the building, we're reminded what we're here for every time we, we meet, whether it's professional development, whether it's uh, board meetings. Down below, you're going to see, and I think, does this have one of those lights? Yes. Uh -huh. the, on the side? Right there. Right there. Right there, you're going to see links, and so when people access this, this particular slide <coughs> or this presentation, they're going to be able to go into the links because you want to see the supporting documents that are there. When you click on this particular link, it's going to go into the docs of the school improvement plan. It's going to be more in a format that you can read. <coughs> Our strategic planning process, um, strategic planning retreat actually began on June 10th last year. Formal introductions, strategic planning teams and expectations, we went through underlying values and beliefs. Missions, state of the district, identifying discussion and district strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We also went through setting the district's direction, defining the vision, and prioritization exercise. And those that were participant in this, we worked on core components, the values and beliefs, vision, mission, and the values of tomorrow and the place for today. Setting goals, student success. We divine, if you've ever participated in this process, or you're part of a, perhaps an organization, a company, a corporation, uh, I think a lot of plans are developed, I know a lot of plans are developed, that uh, they, they never come to fruition. Uh, mission statements are long, too many goals. We have five specific areas that we wanted to, to address. Student success, staff, finance, culture, and facilities. And you're going to see that there are goals and outcomes uh, aligned with each of those. 
First, it's the stakeholders that were involved. Uh, together, everyone achieves more. ISB, or excuse me, IASB, IASB and the uh, BSC, or BCSD, Board of Education, Ball Chatham School District, and the community. So we actually had 55 invitees uh, as part of this process. Uh, we ended up with about 40, 42 participants in all. Larry Dirks is a director, field director for Illinois Association of School Boards. There you can see, of course, are the board members who participated. This is our school district superintendent, assistant soup. We have the school directors, we have school administrators, and teachers and staff that were involved in the process as well. Community members, as you can see, we had a very diverse population. We even have the mayor participate. I actually invited several representatives, state representatives, to participate. Uh, and they had not, uh, they were busy. So I understand that. That's okay. And what I wanted to do is, I'll, well, I'll go back and maybe we'll hit some of the links in a minute. The first one we have are our values and beliefs, and these are different than what they've been in the past. Uh, each student can be a problem solver, critical thinker, and innovator. That's number one. It's about the students, it's not about the adults. And I think too often we, we don't put that in perspective. Uh, this is, we're in the kid business. I believe in high expectations, instruction, and learning should be flexible and differentiated. And a, Community and family engagement, uh, to the best of our ability, continue. We have a tremendous resource in this community, a very professional community, uh, whether it's engineers, whether it's attorneys, whether it's educators, whether it's politicians for that matter. So we're going to look at engaging them at a higher level. Collaborative teamwork and effective communication leads to success in a safe and welcoming environment. Learning is our priority. And a culture that promotes positive relationships and mutual respect. Learning extends beyond the classroom, and we've already begun that process. Uh, as you can see, Lincoln Land Community College, we're getting our dual courses in line. We have a great relationship with CACC, and so we're going to continue down that path to offer more and more opportunities for our students. We believe in strong character and personal integrity, and each person adds value to our organization, whether it's a student, support staff, uh, teacher, administrator, community member. <coughs> Our vision is simple. We're going to take that and we're going to replace that. Uh, our community makes it possible. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of resources in our community. And we need to make sure that we access those. Our staff makes it attainable without our teachers, our support staff, administrators, directors, board of education. It's simply not attainable. So everyone's going to be involved. And our students make it happen. It's that simple. It doesn't have to be a laborious statement. It doesn't have to talk about 21st century learners and technology and books and all the other stuff that gets written out in, in a variety of mission statements. That's what uh, success looks like for Ball Chatham. Our mission, the Ball Chatham School District, together with the community, develops the unique potential of each student by providing quality, challenging, and engaging opportunities that establish a foundation for lifelong success positive contributions to society. Goal areas, as we said, are the five to the left. Now we're going to delve into each one. We'll go back. And like I said, down here on the bottom, we're going to be able to access in the, When you go into each of these areas for student success, for example, you'll be able to access our learning plans for each of the schools. Uh, and that's the work that was done by our, by our teachers, our administrators. And then we're also going to document and track that success. Um, data is not everything, but it is a big part of what we do. It is a good barometer to measure ourselves. Goals and indicators. What will we do and how will it be measured? <coughs> Goal area one is student success. All students are positioned to attain individualized success and achievement. Goal one, academics will be of high quality and engaging. And the indicator to achieve that is indicator 1A. Goal B is going to implement methodology and strategies that define individualized success. And C, extracurricular opportunities. You know, one of the things that we definitely are known for in this, in this uh, region is not only our academics, but our extracurriculars. And the research is very clear on that. 
the more the kids are tied into activities outside of their academics, the more responsive and responsible they are in the academic setting. So we want to make sure that they're offered those opportunities as well. Now when you go down there, I don't know if you can click on that. Can you click on that one below? Does that give you an opportunity to link out there? Um, no. So I'm not going to allow her to? You know, you'd have to exit, exit out of full screen, but it's here probably. Well, I'll go back. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we can do that. I'll, for the sake of time, I'll spare you. But what you're going to see in those documents is the progress that we've made over the last year or two and what our anticipated progress is going to be. So, for example, we talked about what is the end, end game when we're looking at student achievement. And if you look at park assessment, for example, uh, we have areas of strength and we have areas that we can certainly improve. Um, and so when we originally said, what is our end goal? Not our goal for this year, not our goal for next year, but what are we looking to do? And if you look at it, I would say, if you were to achieve 80% at an 80% level, is that good, bad, or different? 80%? 80. Good. That's good. I know. Now next, I'm gonna have come up here. I'm gonna have no. I'm just. <laughs> I wouldn't She's do that. She was gonna do it. I wouldn't do that. No, but 80 percent is good. But if you look at park scores, it's been a change over the last four years. It really has been a moving target. Okay. And so we've had to adjust. Uh, we're hoping to get some more consistency. However, we, it will be said that uh, they're looking at changing something again. <laughs> on the park, so it might move again. But that doesn't, what we have to do is we, we're going to stay in control of what, what we can control. And that is uh, setting our academic path. So, for example, 80% uh, is our end goal. Some areas were 40%, uh, some at 60%. Um, and, I, and somebody had asked me, do you, do you think you can make that large jump in four years? Can you get to 80%? I said the goal shouldn't be necessary to get to that in one fell swoop. Uh, yes, we can achieve 80 percent. We have the students, we have the community, we have the teachers, uh, we have the support staff, and we have those who have direction of where we need to go. And if we set those goals, we will achieve. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So you're going to see us be able to track that data at any time. You can go to those forms, those sheets, and see how we're doing. Number two is staff. Uh, all staff will be provided appropriate professional development to include cultural competency, best practice, and social emotional competence. And I think you're going to say, you know, all three of those are very reasonable, particularly if you do any, any research and study on, on how to best affect learning in the classroom. Uh, real focus right now, of course, is social emotional intelligence. Uh, making sure, I'm a big believer, I think it's all said in one simple <laughs> statement, you have to reach into teaching. That's what it comes down to. And so we're going to continue to work on that. And it's going to be evidenced by the professional development activities. And what you're going to see down below is each year we're going to put what are the activities that we're doing in district to help support these goals. And that might adjust. And, you know, we might adjust that during the year because teachers are involved in that, administration is involved in that. So you're going to be able to access that and see what we're doing throughout the year to meet those goals. Part two of that is all staff will be given support and resources for success, including competitive compensation, appropriate class size, and mentoring. Now, there are school districts that are afraid to put all of that in there. And you can't be afraid to put all in there because that's something we need to pursue. We need to make sure that our staff and our teachers are properly compensated. We want to make sure that we're highly competitive. We want to make sure that um, class sizes are appropriate. And that's something that we've been addressing a little bit of a time. We, we have hired staff. Um, we have four coaches now. Uh, we would love to see that increase. I know the board is in favor of reducing class size, increasing staff to help lower that. Um, and we're going to do the best we can to do that. And that's with, with classroom teachers as well. So uh, over the past couple of years, we've really focused on making sure we, uh, through our Director of Finance, Charlotte's done a wonderful job working with all of our departments and our administrators and teachers to make sure that um, we're able to uh, 
be fiscally responsible so that we can devote those dollars towards our teachers, our staff, and our students. And then uh, evidence, uh, last one was mentoring. And I think that's going to be one of the key is just continue to provide assistance for our staff, but also for our students. Uh, but the more that we can do that through coaching and those types of things are going to be very, very supportive. Third goal area is finance. And this is, you know, a lot of people don't think about this, uh, but in school district, we were about, you know, $50 million corporation. When you boil the well, the fat, that's about what we are right in that neighborhood. Um, we've done a lot of uh, soul searching over the past two, three years in finance and making sure that we're being as efficient and frugal um, while still being able to uh, pay attention to all the fund balances. Uh, we've been able to provide additional service and resources. I mean, you're going to see tonight one of the things we're brought forward is an adoption of a new language arts curriculum. Uh, just a year and a half ago, we adopted a new math curriculum. And uh, this is in a time where, uh, you know, some people are not willing to commit to those things, but, but we are because we think it's important for our staff to have and our students to have and our community to have. Maintain a balanced budget that reflects board identified priorities. You're going to be able to link on to here down at the bottom, and it's going to, there's our budget. Now, currently, many of these documents are accessible. Our budget, for example, our audit, uh, we want transparency. We want to show the community that we're being fiscally responsible with <coughs> the tax dollars. Now, we should be held accountable for that, absolutely. And if we're not, we need to be called to task on it. Um, evidence by a balanced budget that reflects priority and allocation of funds to support prioritization of board goals. We need to be able to go back, and that's why it's important that it's in there, it's in the books, it's in everything we do, that whenever we're looking to uh, allocate resources, it needs to be tied into our goal. If it's not tied into our goals, then it shouldn't be a goal. Now, not to say that there's going to be a time where we need to shift something because of an emergency or something we need to do. That may happen from time to time. But at the end of the day, we're going to prioritize. Pursue all funding sources while controlling costs. We've gone out and we've accessed quite a few grants. We're doing that. We have a great relationship with our, with our foundation. Uh, they're looking to find ways to support us in our pursuit of a lot of our STEM programs that we're uh, starting to come to fruition and support that. Short and long-term uh, fiscal planning will identify priorities, evidenced by the production of a multi-year prioritization plan of financial planning. Uh, that includes a lot. And finance is one of those things where people, you know, they just don't want to get involved because it's a very complex issue. But we're going to continue to monitor. We're going to continue to pay attention respectfully and, and, uh, and, and fiscally in terms of being responsible, make sure that we manage those so that we can afford our school community opportunities, uh, particularly in the areas of curriculum instruction. Number four is culture. And that is uh, the district will recognize and appreciate the diverse nature of our students, staff, families, and community members to achieve a sense of ownership and pride by all. The district will aggressively seek broad-based two-way communication through a variety of methods in order to connect with and engage the community. Uh, we're going to have surveys. You're going to see there's a link down below It's the five essentials. We did that just as one of the examples. But there's going to be surveys and information. We're going to be accessing that, analyzing data, and using data to inform not only instruction, but to inform what we're doing. Getting that feedback and responding to it is going to be a very important task of ours. And I mean all of ours, because as we get this information, it's not going to be put in a binder, put on a shelf. It's not going to only be seen by directors or just teachers or just uh, administrators or boards. It's going to be seen by everybody so that we can adjust accordingly. I must also say that we do those types of things. It gives you an opportunity to celebrate because there are a lot of great things that go on. So when you see trends in data, make sure you celebrate those, particularly when they speak well of what you're doing. Facilities, resources will be available and utilized to sustain a healthy and safe environment. Uh, determine and allocate appropriate funding for buildings and grounds. 
we've already begun that process. And I don't think there was any better time, unfortunately, with the events that have unfolded in Florida, as you well know, it didn't take such a horrific event to um, call to task our mission to make sure that our students and staff and community is safe. You know, when I arrived here, one of the glaring things that needed to be addressed was the entrance at CE over in Chatham Elementary. Uh, and we were able to get that secure. And uh, not that Ken couldn't wrestle anybody to the ground and take care of the situation. But Randy and his team have been phenomenal. And I do want to take just a moment to highlight that because I don't think, uh, I, I know I don't, I'm often comforted by the fact that Brandy and his team do what they do on a daily basis in our buildings. Uh, you don't see what goes on behind the curtains sometimes, but there's a lot of work. And I just, so I want to take that opportunity to thank Brandy and his staff for dealing and working through situations such as we've had. Although it's not something directly done to us, it affects us all because we're in the business of education. So thank you. And that your correspondence with parents are our collegial effort to make sure we get information pushed out. Um, the visibility and the cooperation with the Chatham Police Department has been outstanding. So if that all just doesn't happen. It's that man and his team right there. So outstanding. Um, and then provide necessary tools and resources to maintain assets and infrastructures. We have some newer buildings here, and we have some aging buildings here, and it's a fine balance because we could have something go wrong in a building, and it costs you fifty, eighty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars to drop of a hat. So what do you do if you have those dollars allocated to go elsewhere? What do you do? Well, it takes a lot of thinking and sometimes having to talk through those things. But if we are able to get ahead of it and maintain those things, as Mike has done in setting out his plan for this district. Um, I feel pretty pretty good about the direction we're going in regards to facilities. Again, you're going to be able to access a facility and grounds report. We even have a, a, a rubric that will show, based on the scoring rubric, um, the allocation of staff in buildings uh, because we want to maintain a certain standard uh, per square footage, making sure that, that our buildings are covered and that they're clean. And I can say with pride that all of the buildings in this district have received a score of A or B. So that's good. C is not too bad. We don't have any of those. But you want to stay out of the D and F categories. So Mike has done a great job with that. So at the end of the day, you're going to be able to link uh, to onto this one particular document. Um, what I like about it, particularly in the student uh, academic area, you're going to be able to plug into um, the Prezi that was also done in regards to the direction uh, Jen had presented and her team, our instructional learning team, um, and it'll actually give you all of the information. So embedded within all of this are going to be links to documents and resources that help us achieve this. So, that is our Ball Chatham School District strategic plan, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. There are things on there that are already being addressed, and uh, we look forward to a bright future. So. How do we access this on the web? Do we have to go to departments or Board of Education, or is it under curriculum and instruction? We're going to make it available on the, on the, on the, on the home page. Okay. We'll, we'll make, not on the not No, board. we don't want you to have to go searching okay, through everything. Great. We do want to make it accessible. Okay. You know, that's one of the things we've even spoke about is okay. how can we make our web presence a little bit. There's so much information. There's so much data. Uh, you're not always going to be able to uh, get everything. <coughs> At the click of a button, you might have to do a little digging through, uh, but we want to make it as user-friendly and as accessible okay, as we can. Okay, that's good. Okay. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <coughs> no? A lot of work went into that. When was the last time we completed one of that? Ten years ago? It was 07, I think. Yeah. Good.
good plan to have in place. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be too redundant on this, and I'm not going to make any of my fellow peers stand up with me. But uh, <laughs> you all may sit, and I will stand, because this is a tremendous amount of work. And I have to tell you, I sweated bullets with Jen and Doug writing the values and belief statement, which is like only an infinite, just a small, small part of all of this. So in any event, don't laugh at me, gentlemen, but I'm Wait. going to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> you have to record that, please. That's just the point. Yeah, record that. <laughs> All right, that was information only. There's no action taken. We appreciate the presentation, Susan. Thank you. Okay, moving on. 4-2, citizens. This is where anybody that has an agenda item they would like to bring to the board, they can uh, do it at this time. Carrie, okay. you have an agenda item you want? Yes. Okay. I think you know the yes. protocol yes. name. Yes. Good evening. Just keep it um, five minutes. Just five minutes. Less than Thomas. Um, my name is Carrie Cat and I'm a 23-year veteran teacher and community member and also the BCA president. Um, tonight and next week, you are going to be um, discussing staffing for the next year. And the district and administrators are already looking at this process. When you, the board, vote on personnel consent items, please keep this in mind. Based on the presentation you just heard and the strategic plan that you've been working on, you have made it a priority to recruit and retain educators. So my question is, what process is being implemented to ensure that this goal is being met and what process is being used to ensure that this process is fair and consistent? Education is an investment and the board's role is to ensure that we are getting the quality in exchange for the resources available. So my concern is, is that the processes that are in place have appropriate checks to ensure that staff's time is being utilized in the most effective way, that training and professional development being provided is linked to the needs of students of this district, and how do we ensure that bias is left out of the process of creating the best possible educational environment for the Ball Chatham community. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. Anybody else? <coughs> no. Nobody else wants to. I think she. Right School board on agenda. Did she want to speak? This one. Did you? <laughs> yeah. You don't want to take. It's an off agenda item. But... Okay. All right. Moving on then. Uh, consent agenda items. We got five one to five twelve. Anybody wish to pull any of them? <coughs> Mm, hearing none, then do I have a motion to approve 5 1 to 5 12 as presented? So moved. I have a second. Second. Betsy, please. Yes, Maddox. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Worley. Excuse me, yes. Uravit. Yes. Durirat. Yes. And Cup. Yes. Uh, personnel consent items. We have 6 1 to 6 40. Anybody wish to pull any of them? I would like to pull 6364 and 65. Okay, anybody else? <laughs> All right, then do I have a motion to approve 6162 and then 66 to 640 as presented? So moved. I have a second. 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 Thank you. That's yes, Sarah. Yes. Worley? Yes. Uribit? Yes. Uribit? Yes. Maddox? Yes. And Cotton? Yes. 6-3. Uh, 
resignation of GMS guidance counselor. Okay, I would just like to um, express my appreciation as a board member for, and I believe I speak on behalf of the entire board, um, to recognize and thank Sandy Marcotte for her services to the district as a GMS guidance counselor. She's been with the district since 2005, and <clears throat> she's seen a lot of changes over those 12 years and has rolled with the punches. And <clears throat> so I just wanted to thank her for her service and recognize that <clears throat> everyone has, a, you know, her support has been appreciated by many, not just board members. So, and then the next um, uh, next person to um, on, the, on the resignation list is um, <clears throat> the resignation of uh, Jessica Viola, who is a GHS guidance counselor. <clears throat> and she, I think, um, has been a wonderful spark in the guidance counseling office in the high school. I can speak about that personally. She's helped my son who is now in his 20s um, and always, you know, having an upbeat attitude on some really, what would otherwise for many people be very disconcerting situations. So. I want to thank Jessica Viola for <clears throat> her services to the, to the district. And the thing about guidance counselors um, is you don't always know, nor <coughs> can you know, some of the difficulties and situations that they address on a daily basis. So um, I think we need to bear that in mind um, when we recognize their accomplishments. Okay, and the next, um, all these really good people are on the personnel consent agenda items for retirement and resignations, and that is um, <coughs> the retirement of um, Cindy Micus um, in the transportation uh, department. And I'm going to buy Jim Lovelace the first box of Kleenex when <laughs> Cindy leaves. I've been through about three or four already. Okay, <laughs> so you can count on that, Jim. You'll get the first box of Kleenex from me. And she has been an invaluable support uh, to the district and will be missed by everyone, including Jim. Maybe most notably Jim. So, in any event, um, that's all I wanted to say. <clears throat> so else? thank you to all. Okay. All right then. We need a motion. We'll do them individually, Betsy. If you'd like. Okay. It's probably for the best. Yes. Okay. So six three resignation <coughs> of GMS guidance council. Do I have a motion to approve? Then move. Have a second. 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 Thank you. Patsy, please. Yes. Worley. Yes. Urevich. Yes. Dury Rush. Yes. Maddox. Yes. Siren. Yes. And Cott. Yes. Uh, six four, resignation of GHS guidance counselor. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a second. Second. Thank you. Patsy, please. Yes. Urevich. Yes. Dury Rush. Yes. Maddox. Yes. Siren. Yes. Worley. Yes. Cott. Yes. Uh, six five, retirement of administrative assistant to transportation director. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. A second. Second. Thank you. Thanks. Dury Raj? Yes. Maddox? Yes. Siren? Yes. Morley? Yes. Urevich? Yes. Cop? Yes. All right. We vote now we have to stay. Yes. Uh, moving on. New business. 7 1. Calendars. School Ooh. calendars. So. Calendars, plural. Two years. Two years. I know, I was kind of impressed. Yeah. Two years. We had a great calendar committee. I need to thank them publicly before I get started. And I have to go in order of my schools. So I have Jody Avery over at Chatham Elementary, and I have Kelly Marchese at GES, and I have Monica Lee over at Ball, 
and Christy Fletcher over at GIS, and Jen Lewis at GMS, and Gary Sneed over at the high school, and Kim Seppich and Betsy Schroeder on our district calendar committee. So uh, we worked hard to get two years of calendars. We have lots of families that call us every year asking for when the dates are of winter break and spring break. I know our teachers like that as well. You're going to see a, a little adjustment to the winter break period. We've heard lots of feedback that people needed two solid weeks. So we listened to that and made some adjustments. And we have uh, two years before you tonight. The only difference really between the two is Veterans Day and year one Veterans Day falls on a Sunday <coughs> and so we still have a waiver. Dr. Woods spoke with our friend from the veterans. Do you want to go ahead and Yeah, no, we, you know, we had a great conversation. I tell you what, the gentleman, uh, actually there was a group from VFW that came in and spoke to us and uh, had a great conversation. I mean, it was dialogue like you're supposed to have. They came in and had a concern and, and uh, expressed why they were very aware that of, of our uh, intent to make sure it was to honor the veterans and, and pay tribute and respect and it was a matter of competing uh, programs uh, that were out there to do the same thing so for us it was a matter of making sure we respect them and hear them out I think even to a greater degree um, the first year which is going to be this upcoming year uh, it was not an issue because it's on the weekend. It was the next year that was the issue uh, because they have a, a big ceremony. So we talked about ways that we could work together to promote their program and talked about ways to make sure all of their members uh, were aware, just not family members, because I think it's important that we honor all of our veterans, even if they don't have students that are part of our school community, to come in and celebrate. So it was a great, yeah, it was a really good conversation. They were very appreciative and so were we. So the first year we will be in session that Monday after the holiday because it's legally observed on that Monday even though all of their celebrations are on Sunday because it's on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month so we're good there. But in the second year, 1920, we will be observing the Veterans Day holiday which is different from this year and next year. So that's really the difference. And that calendar committee, I tell you what, they are brilliant. It is a well-oiled machine. Kim and Betsy can speak to it. They know the calendar rules inside and out because there is such specific guidance from ISBE that is very difficult to kind of decipher and make sure you understand, but that team, we need to keep the same people carried because I love working with them. So, two years of calendar. Great. Yeah, that's an action. We got to mm -hmm. prove that. So Sip days are on there and everything this time. One vote for two years. So moved. Yeah, can I have a second then? Second. Okay, you're right. Any further discussion? Metsy, please. Yep. Maddox? Yes. Sarah? Yes. yes. Worley? Yes. Uravich? Yes. Durarash? Yes. <coughs> yes. Um, quick question. So then do we have to approve that Veterans Day waiver? We are not asking for the waiver. No, we're not. We okay, we're that. good. We're yeah. going. Mm -hmm. okay. We're going to observe only, the holiday. Gotcha. Okay. No. No. Very good. Uh, moving on, 7-2, we got uh, English Language Arts uh, Resource adoption. I really have no presentation because I gave you a long one in November from our instructional leadership team and Dr. Wood followed up with today. It's in response to our goal and our strategic plan from student success. Our teachers desperately need resources, and I mean desperately. So we're starting this year with K-5. We are ready to move forward. We vetted out 12 different resources, a team of 29 Different staff members worked hard on this to come up with what we think is ideal for our teachers. We worked with Charlotte on the finance end. It's gone through the finance committee. We are good to go. Once we approve this, then I can shift focus to 612 ELA because they are ready to get going. And then when they finish, I'm going to be back again with the next content area. You see several science teachers here. I have a feeling it could be them, not committee, but I know they're looking at me. <laughs> like we're ready, right? They're ready. All right. So now the 29 teachers that um, helped review the materials, how were they just, um, okay, so it was K through five. So it was classroom teachers, were there, is that correct? Well, there were administrators, classroom teachers, special education teachers, okay. interventionists, instructional coaches. Okay. And while that was the core team of leaders, they also then went out and met with their own grade level team. So really, all teachers, K-5, 
have seen these resources, have touched them, have played with them a little bit, but it was that core team of 29 that really went through a long, extensive progress process of several meetings and reports to get to this point. Well, I'm happy because we don't, I'm, I'm happy to see this. We should not use the Xerox machine for official district resources. This is authentic text. This is, right. this is an excellent It's resource. the way it should be. Mm -hmm. so. So these resources for only for the English language arts or STEM courses? This is just English language arts. Okay. Now, it is an integrated approach, so there will be science and social studies content <coughs> taught through these resources. So you are going to see several authentic texts that address STEM concepts or scientific concepts, but there's nothing specific to STEM resources in this. You move already? I moved. Second. I don't know if you guys have any more comments, questions? They're good. We're just going to we're spending it for how much? Half a million here? Yeah, but according to the uh, schedule, you should see how much we aren't being charged for. Yeah, saved a lot of money on this one. Okay. The yeah. first quote started at 770000 yeah. yeah. But I got down to 394 All right, ready? You ready to take the CPA exam? No. Okay. <laughs> That's my brother. Okay, we're ready. Sarah? Yes. Morley? Yes. Yuri Evans? Yes. Yuri Raj? Yes. Maddox? Yes. And Cop? Yes. Jan, thank you. Yes. Uh, seven three resolution for interfund loan, Charlotte. This is the time of year when I come to the board and ask for your permission to tap into working cash should I need it to meet payroll. Uh, in the past, that's fallen anywhere from um, late March to mid-April, um, which is why we make this request in February. Um, I, I don't anticipate it needing it before late April at the earliest, if then, um, because we get early tax dollars mid-May, but I want to be prepared just in case. And we do pay this back always. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was shuffling money around. Right? Exactly. Finance committee good with? Yeah. Yep. Normal practice. Mm -hmm. Normal practice. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a second. Second. Thank you. Betsy. Please. Yes. Morley. Yes. Yuri Bitch. Yes. Yuri Raj. Yes. Maddox. Yes. Siren. Yes. Cop. Yes. Uh, looks like you're back up. That's transfer of excess bond funds. Let me, four. let me begin just by giving a little bit of background to this. Um, your 2015 um, bond sell, you have three years to spend that money. Um, that money was supposed to have been spent by March 1st, and I mean March 1st next week. Um, it became clear that wasn't going to happen. If it remains in the bond construction fund, IRS wants a timeline on when you're going to spend that, and they want that timeline to be reasonable, although they, didn't, they don't give you any information on what they deem reasonable. And in talking with Mike, it kind of became clear that there was a desire to hold on to some of this money instead of trying to spend it in a short time just to meet the IRS regulations. Um, I contacted our bond attorneys, Chapman and Cutler, um, because I'd seen Linda Gibbon, who is with that firm, give a presentation on the ability to transfer excess bond proceeds into operations and maintenance funds. Um, that's done clearly with the resolution that states that you met the original intent of the bonds and that these are excess funds. They get moved into operations and maintenance, but I want to assure you that those stay tracked. Um, they can only be spent by IRS regulations. We still can only spend it on capital expenditures, and we will have to track that if we're ever audited. If that, if that bond is ever audited by IRS, uh, we'll need to be able to prove exactly how these monies have been spent. And Mike and I have already talked about the processes in place to be able to capture that information. Um, I think that um, I agree with our attorneys that this is in the best interest of the district to do this resolution and make this transfer. Do you have any questions? No, but I have a comment, and that is um, Charlotte has been 
just so fantastic in getting this nailed down um, so that all our uh, T's are crossed and our I's are dotted. And um, Dwayne once used the word tenacious, and I mean, that is really true. And um, I, I imagine I speak for Dwayne. We really appreciate this, Charlotte, that you know, it's, it's complicated and you know, you have to set up the processes so that the IRS is going to be inundated with documentation if they should ever come calling. And so I want to thank you um, as a finance committee member for, for taking care of this so, so um, <clears throat> impeccably well. Thank you. Thank you. Just a little bit of background, what we talk about in the Finance Committee. Um, we are in, as far as debt load, I'd say we're worse than average for the state of Illinois for debt load. Uh, the good news is in 2028, I believe, we will be debt free. So this also helps allow us to kind of limp along and Mike can get, let's keep everything safe and up to date without having to have another referendum uh, and you know in 2028 we'll have 10 million dollars that we're paying every year that's just we can do something then uh, you know that is a really good point um our debt load is at 11 percent and that um the state is at like 3.8 percent so um Dwayne is um Dwayne it's really, uh, that was a very um, telling piece of information that the Finance Committee just, just reviewed. And that was due to Charlotte's research on helping us start to see our district relative to the industry at wide. So again, thank you on that, Charlotte. Any more questions? Comments? If not, I need a motion to approve the resolution as presented to transfer the excess funds on deposit and site and construction fund of the operations and maintenance fund. So moved. Second. I have a second. Thank you. Betsy, please. Yes. You're right it? Yes. You're right? Yes. Maddox? Yes. Siren? Yes. Worley? Yes. Cox? Yes. Charlotte, thank you. Uh, moving on, we've got 7-5, uh, the approval to proceed with advertising contracts for the scoreboard projects at Glenwood High School. Dusty? <coughs> so we worked with uh, the Dactronics and uh, to draw up the contracts. Dr. Wood and I sent the contracts to our, our school lawyers and uh, he looked it over. Um, we tightened up the language in just a few small areas and uh, the contracts that are attached uh, are the contracts that we'd like to go forward with uh, with uh, companies that, and we have some waiting for the contracts to be sent. I'm happy to say that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm Comments? just assuming things, but this allows you to take the next step where people actually start signing up. Yes. And has that been... Uh, I've got companies waiting for it to be approved so that I can send them the contracts. Okay. Rock on. Okay. Any questions? I know you had, there were some that you were had kind of brought up. What's some other issues, Susan? I <clears throat> are, are you I, good? Um right, we're just going to you know uh, keep our fingers crossed testing and <coughs> keep on charging. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was kind of an opportunity for a little bit of a status update. So if anybody's got any questions now, it's time to. What is the next step? Ever? Say next we approve this. Well, what? Okay, so the next step is the companies that have kind of given me the verbal commitment. So I'll send those the contracts. We've still got companies that we're talking to that are still meeting with their people, still contemplating uh, advertising or at what level they're going to advertise. And once we've secured all of the top two tiers of our advertising, then we will start pursuing some more of the smaller digital ads that will also run. So you only have so many slots to fill? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Dusty, there was a question brought up mm -hmm. to me about the, 
guess the village had to do some <laughs> ordinances or some sort of zoning, mm -hmm. doing some checks to see if the height and yeah. some dimensions on these scoreboards were going to be in violation of anything at all. Sure. None so, of my, that, so everything that I've been told everything is in the clear and nothing's still in violation. Good. Okay. I think that was on their, it was going to be on their February agenda. So, isn't that correct, Joe? They're having a meeting tonight about it. Yeah, they're having a meeting tonight about it, exactly. So we can read about it on Thursday, right, Joe? Sure. <laughs> okay. Anybody else got any questions for? I think they were actually going to talk about rewriting some of their ordinances so that it didn't apply to schools and parks. Is one of the one of the ways that they were going to talk about addressing that, as well as through the planning and zoning. Okay, so nothing to hold up the projects or nothing. It's, should, it should, should be. I just talked to Ryan. I think we yeah. both just talked to Ryan within the last week, and didn't seem to be any any reservations or concerns from his part that anything was going to be a problem. Okay. Very good. Then if there's no more questions. Do I have a motion then to so move? I'll second that. Go ahead and uh, move forward. That's you, please. Yuri Rush? Yes. Maddox? Yes. Siren? Yes. Morley? Yes. Yuri Vitt? Yes. Cock? Yes. Dusty, thanks. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we got 7 6 a request to seek proposals for some GMS band instruments. Yes, Tina, thank you. your kids want to make some more noise? <laughs> exactly. Well, um, Thank you for um, taking this into consideration. It's, it's wonderful to see the many things that um, we do for all of our students tonight. We've covered academics, we've covered athletics, and now we'd like to cover a little bit of the electives in the area of music. Um, first of all, Dennis Marcotte, he is our band director for GIS GMS, and um, it's amazing what our kids do. He works with over 300 students, and he is very passionate about music. And um, for some time, I know he's been wanting to get his hands on more and more instruments. And I've kind of been like, well, now's not the time. Just hold off, it's not the time. Well, now's the time. So I'm here to ask for your approval for us to be able to um, seek proposals for band instruments that will really help our students to, to um, sound even better than they already do. <coughs> I do have a couple questions on that. There were two options that <clears throat> were provided, and um, Dennis, it, it appeared from the memo that you drafted, you would prefer to have um, fewer of the higher quality instruments. If we got to that point, yeah. Um, you would prefer to have fewer of the, you know, I think it's Yamaha. Yeah, Yamaha is a good quality. Okay, so, I mean, you know, um, Charlotte, um, I mean, basically Charlotte and you and whomever and Tina will work out on the details, but I just wanted to make sure that I understood that cor correctly. And maybe um, a possibility, and I'm saying this as a possibility, um, there could be a two-step program to updating the band instruments and um, adding to them. It's a, it's a wonderful program and, you know, the instruments do, they serve their purpose well, plus some, right? Okay. So really, um, we we're taking it out to bid, um, but then the, I mean, basically you all are in agreement with you know, the numbers are such that you have to reduce the, you know, the total count of the instruments you're willing to do that. We feel that um, if the instrument is of higher quality, it'll end up lasting longer. Okay. And so definitely we would take that in consideration. And there's some things in there that could possibly, it's like, I don't want to say it's luxury, but something that could add, but might be mm -hmm. something that we don't need to get in order so we can maybe get the Yamaha tubas compared to Jupiter tubas. So are we voting to go to bid and then you'll bring that back, or how's this working? Um, Charlotte shared with me some paperwork as far as how it would work, so you would approve, I guess, seeking bids, and then uh, we go out and get the bids and then we'll come back and we go with that. That works. It's the best. So this information is basically what you're aware of currently. Correct. And the idea would be to 
strong arm if you can Yes, and we're working very closely with Charlotte because like you said, she is the expert in this area. <laughs> so move. Second. Right. I have a second. Betsy, please. Yes. Uh, Maddox. Yes. Siren. Yes. Morley. Yes. Your image. Yes. Your image. Yes. yes. And Cup. Yes. Thank Tina you very Dennis. much. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, we're into communications. Eight one future board meeting dates. <coughs> March sixth. So we've got a personnel special meeting. This or the fifth. I'm sorry, the sixth. There's an Abe Lincoln dinner. Division meeting in Clinton. The second Thursday regular board meeting and the April regular board meeting. Anybody got any others they need the rest. information on or want to bring up or okay that's information only um, moving on eight two this is where anybody has anything they want to bring before the board on any item it doesn't have to be on the agenda and if you could just I have to hit that one. Yeah, if you would, wouldn't mind, just kind of state your name and... Okay. My name is Karen George. We've been in the district about two years. I have a son at the high school. My daughter, Katie, is in eighth grade. Um, I have a question as relates to discipline procedures. Um, we've had some back and forth with Ms. Rutt and my husband, and I just need to get something clear. Um, she's had some problems in some of her classes with loud and disruptive behavior, and we have asked if if they can't get a hold the control of the kids, that some of these kids be removed from the classroom, not forever, but get out of my classroom, go to the counselor's office, go to the principal's office, and we've been told that that's not possible. Um, and most recently. Um, we were advised that Senate Bill 100 is what prevents kids from being moved out of the classroom. I studied that bill, and I also studied the state dis disciplinary procedures, and I also studied the board disciplinary procedures, and I can't find anything in any of that that says the teachers aren't authorized to remove the kids from the classroom, and in fact are encouraged to remove the kids from the classroom. So I just want to make sure that I am understanding, or if you can tell me, other than suspensions of more than three days or expulsions, does the Senate Bill 100 have on a day-to-day, -day, these are the procedures you can do at school. If you've got a kid who's being disrupted, you can kick him out of the classroom for the rest of that class period. I, well, I can just speak that I know that Senate Bill 100 has changed some of the parameters of the classroom. Uh, discipline and procedures, but I don't know the specifics. That'd be something I'd have to follow okay. up with the administration. I, I, like I said, I can't no, I, I find anything that spe speaks sure. to a classroom procedure as much as it is sure. an ongoing thing. Yeah, so. and, I, and I don't know the specifics, but I can follow up. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Any of you? No? Well, we've read Senate Bill 100. The problem we have here tonight is we, like, I can't speak for the board, so we typically talk about subjects like this and then but probably guess, Dr. Wood will get back to you. This would be my question though because when I look at the guidelines on your handbook I'm presuming that that bill is considered in that. Correct. Right? Correct. So and in fact in your disciplinary measures you've got in here disciplinary measures may include without limitation temporary removal from the classroom. Sure. So I just need you guys are all in favor. If somebody's being disruptive, they can be temporarily removed from the classroom. Well, I don't know all the circumstances, but I could follow up with administration and find out a little bit more as I don't want to discuss a student discipline matter in public. But I can I wasn't get saying specific no, student. I'm just I, trying to make sure no, that the teachers have that oh, authority sure. to be able sure, to Sure, there, there's a broad base of authority that you have in the classroom. That's what I want to I just to don't know the specifics and I don't have to follow I'm just up. looking for that broad general okay. instruction that they have the sure. power to do that. Sure. That's why I need it. Thank you. You're good, Karen. Okay, thank you. Steve? Yeah. I was going to go back to Carrie. Carrie Cat. Yes, sir. Um, 
somebody will, or I just want to make sure somebody's going to follow up with her concern that she brought up earlier. Yeah. And you, you understand already that yes, we can't so. talk to you tonight yes. about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Yes, please. My name is Jennifer Maldi. Okay, go ahead and just step up to the podium and... Again, my name is Jen Grimaldi. I am one of the art teachers at the high school. I wanted to make the board aware of the situation concerning my employment with the district. On August 10th, 2017, I was in a district-wide new teacher orientation meeting where an administrator, and actually multiple administrators, continuously made statements about how our families come first to the new 30-plus teachers. This was encouraging, since my family is of utmost importance to me. Shortly thereafter, I was first provided the district calendar, and I panicked. The previous March, my family and I booked a trip to Brazil to visit my husband's family. My husband is from there. Many of the members on his side of the family have been ill, including his father with prostate cancer and his uncle with pancreatic cancer. And the trip may have been one of the last chances for our entire family to get together for Christmas. Besides my immediate family, which consists of my husband, four children, and I, other members were traveling from other parts of the world for the visit. I immediately noticed the conflict with the school work days as soon as I saw the school calendar and notified administration. I was completely transparent and honest with the administration about my family's trip from the beginning. I promptly requested three personal days to cover my absence. My request was denied. When I asked the superintendent if he wanted to see some form of documentation or purchase of these tickets, if he wanted me to stop by the district office or what I should do, he did not respond to me or give me any options. The only option offered to me in a prior email was to reschedule or cancel my trip. However, I informed him that this was not an option as we had already spent more than $10,000, which was actually more than $12,000, on just our flights. <coughs> Once you have a visa for a trip, there is not a lot of room for changing your trip overseas. And at that point, there were no more flights available for six passengers, <coughs> my husband, our four children, and myself, for the relevant time period. We had spent an additional $5,000 on other forms of transportation and lodging in advance as well. This was all booked and paid for on March 5th and 6th of 2017, well before my employment with the district. Rescheduling the trip was also not an option, as other families were also flying into different parts of Brazil to meet us, some coming all the way from Switzerland. As an alternative, I had offered the principal of my building to take non-paid docked days to cover my time. He later informed me that I was not tenured, therefore I was not eligible to take non-paid days. I am aware of several in-district teachers who have been permitted to take days next to holidays and not next to holidays, and one very recently this last month. I was informed that I am also eligible for both personal and non-paid days and that the superintendent may grant both personal and non-paid days next to a holiday to employees with extenuating circumstances. I, it should be noted throughout the year I have been an exemplary employee attending every required meeting including first year teacher meetings which they require for new teachers within the district but should really be for first time teachers. During my employment with the district, all my evaluations were rated proficient and excellent, and also receiving a rating of excellent in student growth. In fact, during my over 14 years of teaching high school, I have always had proficient to excellent evaluations and have never had any disciplinary actions. I also played an integral role in rewriting the school's AP, 2D, and 3D art syllabuses, as the district's curriculum for those classes was no longer accepted by the college board. As a matter of pure coincidence, on December 15th, shortly before I, my scheduled trip, I became very ill. My students kept asking me why I didn't go home, because I looked terrible. I worked the entire day with a fever and even consulted the nurse in my building, who confirmed I had a fever and offered medication. I took my own, which was in my purse, because I have to be careful of what I take. Immediately after work, I went to Memorial Family Medical Center in Lincoln. 
where they confirmed I had flu-like symptoms and an eardrum that nearly ruptured. I was given three different prescriptions and was told that if it wasn't the flu, then it was a respiratory infection that was going around, which has been lasting more than a week. I had symptoms for the next three weeks and was still coughing at the fact-finding meeting, which took place on January 10th and 12th. I was informed on February 2nd, which was a personal day, used to close on my house to be closer to this job, of a meeting to take place at the district office on January 5th. I was effectively denied my choice of representation on January 5th in accordance to Article 4 of the Collective Bargaining Agreement as the administration was not flexible for the time to meet at 3 p.m. as opposed to 12.30. I was forced to leave the building during my class, during which the administration did not find someone to cover my class for the time that I was to be gone at the district office. My seventh hour class sat for more than 20 minutes without any supervision. I was also not informed in advance that the meeting at the district office was to be considered a disciplinary hearing, also a violation of the CBA. At the meeting on January 5th, the superintendent informed me that the options for me back in August were to resign my position or forego my vacation. At no point was this ultimatum made clear. In fact, there was no response to any of my prior inquiries regarding clarification or options. The superintendent then told me that it didn't matter that I was sick or if I had a doctor's note because I went against what he said and went on my trip anyway. They then told me I was suspended for three days beginning on February 7th through 9th. In doing so, the administration did not follow the progressive disciplinary procedures established by the CBA in Article 4. Also, absolutely no effect was made to engage in discussions to resolve the issue before it reached a degree of seriousness to require further discipline. See CBA Article 4, Section F. In respect to any alleged misconduct, an e effort will be made through discussion between the employee and administration to resolve problems before they reach a degree of seriousness to require further discipline. As is written in the disciplinary findings, no specific corrective actions were recommended, most probably because this was a unique situation beyond my control and likely never to come up again. As such, outside the three days of suspension, no other disciplinary actions were outlined at my continued employment with the district was not in question or even mentioned. When I checked with the secretary on February 6th to see who was covering my classes for February 7th and 9th, she looked at me with a blank stare and asked me what I was talking about. She was never informed nor asked by the district office or the principal to find someone to cover my classes for those three suspended days. The principal was gone that day as well, so he wasn't there to inform her either. On February 14th, I filed a grievance toward the district office as I believed the treatment of my situation was not just. Not two hours after I filed the grievance, I was notified by email of a post-conference meeting to take place in the principal's office on February 15th. Because all of my evaluations and post-conferences were done at the beginning of December, I asked the principal what this was concerning on two separate occasions, yet he chose not to respond to me. He had originally planned the meeting so that it would be missing instructional time with my students, as opposed to during my prep. After pointing this fact out on February 15th, I was summoned at an earlier time during my prep period to speak with the principal. It was clear from the start that this meeting was disciplinary in action. When I asserted my union rights to have representation present, he attempted to deny my representation by telling me he had no questions and that this was strictly related to evaluations. This was <coughs> odd since all my evaluations for the year had already been completed at the time. When I pressured further to the nature of the meeting, <coughs> his response was continuing employment. I stated that I wanted representation and that I would return. There was no current building representation available at the time. I took a former rep with me who agreed to accompany me. Upon our return, the principal stated that they were moving in another direction regarding my continued employment. When my representation 
asked if he had any recommendations regarding any changes in conduct I could implement in the future. He stated he would not offer any until after either I resigned the position or the board was to take action. He never once mentioned or referenced my actual evaluations. As a reminder, all my previous evaluations were proficient and excellent, and my student growth in the classroom was also excellent. In the comments <coughs> at the end of each evaluation, there were never any recommendations on changes that should be made within my teaching strategies. They were all glowing comments. It is absolutely clear that the decision not to renew my contract was retaliatory in nature, as the notice requesting a post-conference meeting came two hours after I filed it. <coughs> this retaliatory discharge is in violation of the rules and regulations prohibiting unfair labor practices. Thank you for your time. Jennifer, thank you. Um. <coughs> Anybody else? Got anything they want to bring for the board? No. Just so you guys know, there has been a grievance on this, so there is. <coughs> there is investigation going on, so. I was going to ask if we should go into closed session and discuss. Or? Uh, there's no action item on the agenda for tonight, but. So we haven't voted on anything yet? No. Okay. Well, could we go back into closed session um, just to have a maybe a more detailed um, <clears throat> where, where you know, the district is and the grievance process? Excuse me. <coughs> grievance process. Sure. That, that fact was not known. Anybody else? Okay, then I need a motion to adjourn, and then is it consensus that we want to go into closed session now? Yeah. I would I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should we uh, let them know why we're all wearing pink? You probably have all figured it out. <laughs> Here, um, uh, it's a tribute um, to Carly Pierce, and so um, <coughs> it's the first time that um, the entire board has uh, been together. So that's why we're wearing pink. But as an aside, I think the gentleman looked really good in pink, and so I would suggest you expand this color in your wardrobe. I'll try. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> All right, then do I have a, so move. Do I have a second? Second. <coughs> Great. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Good night, everybody. Thanks for your attendance. Thank you.